Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to listen to us. Uh, my name is Nikolai. I'm from Cyber Interactive. And today with uh, Jordan Logan from AMD, I would like to tell you about the uh, World War Z and its Vulcan port implementation. Uh, first of all, a few words about the title itself. Uh, World War Z is the latest uh, game developed by Cyber Interactive and released uh, during this spring. It's a third-person shooter created to play cooperatively with the friends. The main goal is to stay alive, uh, destroying hordes of enemies and uh, simultaneously performing various missions. Our game runs on a PC with a Vulcan in, and Direct, uh, DirectX 11 backends and on consoles too. It supports rendering to the resolution up to 4K. Well, here's the main ideas of our rendering system. We are doing a full Z pre-pass. It helps us to eliminate the overdraw in a further color pass, but also provide the opportunity to do some pre-shading tasks based on Z pass data. To decrease the complexity of the color pass further, uh, we prefer to store the filtered shading, shadowing information uh, from the first uh, four dynamic lights to the separate render target. Uh, for the shading itself, we use the forward plus clustered approach. It means that the dynamic lights and reflection probes uh, are being rasterized to the camera space voxel grid, which is being used by the forward uh, shading loop. Uh, our engine implies the GPU-driven visibility system. It does the frustum and the occlusion calling for the whole scene. Then, uh, in, then the results are read back uh, on the CPU side. This approach involves the two frames latency. This is rather a classical scheme when the game update thread mm, runs in parallel uh, with the previous frame rendering. Uh, and the GPU is running slightly behind all of this. So here is the GPU di diagram for the one frame. The parallel rectangles are assumed to be running simultaneously and the data um, and the arrows means the data dependencies. Uh, so uh, let's start. At the start of every frame, we need to do the Z pass. Uh, we are rendering objects in front to back order to fully utilize the high Z GPU cooling, uh, cooling. Besides of depths, we also store the wall space vertex normals. This pass is almost stateless. Uh, it means that it doesn't use any uh, additional textures, unnecessary vertex streams, or uh, constant buffers. It has been designed to be very fast from, on the both sides, on the CPU and the GPU. Uh, for, for the shadows, we use a rather usual percentage closer filtering solution with up to 12 person disk samples uh, rotated by a screen space 3 by 3 the matrix. Afterwards, the depth of a blur with a kernel of the uh, same size is applied to the whole mask. For uh, directional lights, we use the parallel split scheme with up to three splits. Each split first rendered into the shadow map, then corresponding depth buffer region marked with a stencil, and after that, uh, the shadow information projected to the screen space is stored to the one of the channels of this mask. We also need to store the splits into the separate fixed resolution atlas, which is later used by the transparent geometry. Uh, now it is very important to care about the occlusion term to show the context between the different objects. For the uh, large scale high quality occlusion can be easily pre-computed pre to the light map, but the solution generally doesn't work for the dynamic objects like uh, characters. Uh, the screen space ambient occlusion helps us a bit, giving a small contact occlusion, but in our case, uh, that was not enough. We want something like uh, soft shadows from the indirect lighting. Uh, so for that, we use the so-called the capsule shadows. The set of capsules attached to each character skeleton. And after that, each capsule can cast uh, the ambient occlusion and the directional occlusion. For the directional part, we use the dominant light direction from the light probe grid. This combined term then applied to the indirect lighting and the reflection of the further color pass. 
so we ended up with the main shading pass. This is the most heavyweight part of other frame. Lots of texture, additional vertex streams, and the huge, very long shaders. All merged here. Besides of the HDR color output, we also uh, we also output small G buffer data to use in the further passes. For example, it can be the mm, velocity vectors mask, which is used by motion blur or TA clamping logic. So that was a short review of the Saber rendering tech. If you are interested, don't hesitate to ask me some additional questions. Also, you can check the presentations of my colleagues from the latest GDC, one about the zombie rendering technique and one about the light map technology. But now it's the uh, best time to talk about the Vulcan port itself. So let's first ask ourselves, does it really care to write tons of boilerplate code, debug hundreds of issues and GPU crashes due to the wrong synchronization, memory access, or something like this? The experience of our studio said that yes, it does. With Vulkan, you can greatly reduce the amount of CPU workload and also makes your GPU run faster. The opportunity to manually batching, submitting rendering comments is a great way to utilize your hardware more. As a bonus, you get the responsibility that you need to care about your video memory allocations by yourself. It's uh, like a double-ended uh, double sword, because on the w one hand, a great chance to make a mistake, but on the other, you, are, no, you doesn't have any driver explicit control so you can do what you want with your memory resources. For example, you can alias them with each other. It uh, helps to greatly reduce the overall video memory consumption of the application. It also helps to do the cool features, for example, like uh, dynamic resolution rendering. Uh, at the end, it works on different operation systems, Windows, Linux, Mac OS X and also on the different platforms like a Google Stadia. So it's a good time to accept this challenge and push the limits of the, your game engine development further. Uh, one of the most brightest features of the World War Z is the ability to show thousands of zombies on the screen at the same time. It helps to immerse the player to the, mm, to the atmosphere of the zombie apocalypse. As a consequence, it turns out uh, that uh, you can easily get a situation when the three main frame passes, like depth, shadow, and color, have a huge number of draw calls. So the CPU preparation cost becomes bigger, and the uh, GPU starts being idling while waiting for a new batch, bunch of rendering comments. Uh, to do something with that uh, and decrease the whole number of frame draw calls, uh, we use the occlusion queries. We order our Z pass in front of back order and store the number of visible pixels during the Z pass. After that, we are waiting for a fence on the CPU side to guarantee that the GPU results are ready. And after that, we use this information during color pass submission to skip draw calls which are completely hidden. In our case, it's a rather effective solution because it can greatly reduce the number of draw calls. Uh, anyway, if you want to use such approach, it is very important to notice that you need to execute some work on the GPU while you're waiting for on a CPU for the G Z pass results. Otherwise, your GPU will be idle while CPU is waiting for uh, results, uh, preparing new rendering comments and submit them. Uh, with a direct, in case of direct 3D11 backend. You, <clears throat> the draw call submission has been organized by a dedicated graphics driver thread. And by default, we don't know exactly when the submissions will be produced. So it's possible to get the GPU idle. To do something with this issue, we need to explicitly flush the common buffer queue two times, one after the Z pass, and one before we are waiting for our occlusion query results gives a small but not negligible CPU overhead. Moreover, direct to the 11 deferred context uh, model doesn't suit uh, the hardware well. It means that you need to exactly load uh, the resources into the physical memory uh, mm, at the time you submit your command lists. Uh, so it, it uh, 
So it gets completely, completely unrealistic for us to use this uh, solution to multi, for the multi-threaded uh, submission. But with Vulkan, we've got an opposite solution uh, submission, uh, situation because it's a completely application responsibility to organize the common buffers recording and providing the synchronization for the common resources. So it's not necessary for, to know uh, the exact resource address during the commons recording. All of these benefits give us a good way to distribute the job across the multiple threads. Uh, now engine we prefer to create not so many additional render workers uh, to avoid uh, unnecessary resource contention between the f threads. In fact, we use the simple rule. If you have uh, more than four physical cores, we prefer to use two additional extra threads to provide the recording of the common buffers. Otherwise, we use only one for submission for recording. And uh, in fact, it is obvious that uh, uh, to, use, to use multiple threads in a part of the frame workflow where the number of the draw calls is really huge. So our main targets are ZPre pass, the shadow map pass, uh, especially the case when you want to draw a lot of splits for the directional light and the main shading pass, which is the pack objects, the transparent objects, and particles. It is also very important to submit enough work mm, to hide uh, the operation system scheduling latency. Mm, small VKQ submit calls can complete faster than the operation system can complete in other ones. In the World War Z game, uh, we prefer to do the only five Q submissions. Uh, with uh, approximately 24 common buffers recorded per frame. We prefer to avoid uh, the explicit fence synchronization, so we just double the amount of common buffers uh, due to the fact that we need to wait uh, for uh, results of the GPU Z pass. We can guarantee that the <coughs> GPU can't fall behind significantly. To summarize, I can say that uh, Vulkan gives a great opportunity for the CPU-bound application. Because of no driver-side validation, uh, we can spend the time for the stuff that really matters. In our case, it can save up to 40% of CPU time. There are the numbers from the AMD Ryzen 7 family CPU. Okay, let's move forward. Now it's time to talk about the GPU performance. Now, if your GP CPU is fast enough, mm, GPU idle will be smaller, and uh, there is a possibility that you can become a GPU bound. So there are several ways to improve it. For example, you can try to utilize your GPU hardware better. In fact, the rasterization becomes a real bottleneck for the draw calls, which use a small or an empty shaders computational power of, it, of the GPU units stay un unused. Luckily, mm, Vulkan provides us a good option, the Sync Compute Queue, uh, which can run compute shaders in parallel with the main rendering. <clears throat> to get the desired effect, it is better to run simultaneously with the passes, which are mainly restressed geometry without any extra arithmetic or memory access work. So in our engine, we do the SSAO, the capsule shadows, the screen space reflections, and the voxel grid rasterization in parallel with the shadow splits rendering. Suddenly, we don't have enough time to finish this feature. So mm, in fact, uh, the post-processing and the frame buffer rasterization are the good candidates to move to async 2. So you can prepare your Z-pass comments for the next frame as early as possible. Uh, it is also a very important feature to control the number of vector registers which is used by your uh, shaders. In fact, the GPU could run several instances of shaders uh, on one compute unit in case of small register and uh, local data storage consumption. So every time one thread waits for a data loaded from the memory, the GPU can run another thread to prevent idling. Corpus Shaders, no engine, uh, the most expensive because you need to use a lot of register space to fetch blend uh, material parameters and also together with the calculation and reflection loops. <coughs> uh, we optimize the number of registers in our shaders in different ways. 
First of all, we do the we apply the cross lane wave intrinsics. So we accelerate our frogs and grid loops by moving some calculations to the scalar registers, which are common for the whole wavefront. I think Jordan should <laughs> tell you more about this in his part. And if it's not possible, uh, we try to pack our material data in several ways. For example, we can move the two single precision values to the one as a 16-bit house. And after that, you can unpack them only by the moment you really need to use them. Also, we try to use the 64-bit arithmetics for our reflection bit mask uh, because we store the eight cube maps with the indices of, of the eight bits. Uh, to effectively processing it with uh, using less number of registers. Uh, here is the small example. <laughs> uh, first of all, we fetch the albedo into the four vector registers. After that, it is clear that because of albedo is typically in an eight-bit normalized format, we can easily store it with a less number of bits without any quality loses. So in GCN architecture, it needs to use the just one instruction to start, values into one, and two to do the unpack. So it's almost three. Uh, being able to execute the shaders on the multiple queues, our game gets a significant benefit. Uh, we don't use any slowliness on any vendors, but also in a difficult case, uh, we can uh, speed up our GPU execution by 10%. Uh, well, uh, it's actually when the shadow, shadow map passes are really huge. Also, the opportunity to use the wave intrinsic and reorganize the shader data flow significantly helps compiler to produce the better results by reducing number of registers and uh, accelerating the execution speed of shaders for up to 20 or maybe 33 percent in some cases. Uh, well, now let's talk about the memory management in Vulkan. Uh, previous generation API managed memory automatically, but now it's a fully application responsibility to create resource, query its memory type, size, and alignment, allocate block of memory, and bind them together. Cyber would prefer to use the Vulkan memory allocator from uh, Adam Savitsky <laughs> from AMD. It is a well-documented open source library which was used in several AAA projects. It's continuously maintained and just working out of the box. It helps uh, it greatly reduce the development time uh, because you don't need to write tons of memory management code. Uh, well, <laughs> Saber we use the fixed number of random targets uh, per frame. So it's obvious that some of them are used only during part of the frame. So we can easily save up some memory by aliasing resources which are not used at the same time. First, we collect uh, some in-game statistics uh, about target's lifetime dependencies. After that, uh, we mark each target uh, with a special bit mask where collected information is stored. Uh, when mm, our algorithm works uh, like a simple CPU memory allocator, during the engine startup, mm, you need to get the all aliased resources for the each random target. After you calculate the pool block uh, memory layout, respecting the dependency bits and alignment. After that, you can get its total size and allocate one device memory block. Uh, you can repeat this process for the other resources as well. Uh, so it's just a simple simple example for the four targets. Firstly, we allocate the first, the largest target, with a, which is sharing memory with the three others. And after that, we process the next, so its bit mask has the zero bit being set. <laughs> so we can simply reuse the same address as the first blue resource. With the next one, we have a small issue because we, ca we cannot share the space with a green target because they are used in a parallel. So we use the remaining space within the first blue resource. Uh, and after that, uh, the next one, uh, the next one, the la last target, uh, should be put it into the blue space, but, but uh, actually we can't do it 
because uh, the blue 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 block is is completely covered by the by another resources. So we just need to put it at the end of our common block. And after that, we can calculate the total size and do the memory allocation. Uh, it is also very important to respect the alignment of the addresses of the render resources. In, in fact, it depends on how resources laying down into the memory from their swizzling and also from the GPU access policy. So to keep in mind this issue, we remember this uh, offsets as a, some kind of a fake render targets and track their maximum sizes. So every time we start searching the suitable space for a new target, we can easily understand uh, are there any holes before. <laughs> uh, and uh, if they are found, uh, just start the search from the beginning of alignment hole to try to utilize it. So, uh, our Vulkan memory suballocation system mimics our console solution, so it helps to write the uniform code to maintain all of the platforms. It is simple because we exactly know when each target is used, so no explicit synchronization really required. And it's also greatly reduced the video memory consumption. Now our test it saves more than 50%. One more important notice, uh, if you actually want to share your compressed render targets with uh, UAPs, you actually need to do the explicit barrier with all the layout set to the undefined to reset the GPU driver metadata, uh, because uh, otherwise you can have a mm, corruption, because driver, driver thinks that uh, the compression, the delta col color comp compression is actually applied to the you have memory space. Well, mm, having so low level memory mm, allocation management allows us to do a really cool features. For example, we can implement the dynamic resolution feature. Uh, we can simply allocate the memory for the largest version of the render target, and after that, uh, map uh, the mm, map the smaller virtual versions to the same memory address. After that, we can switch between them mm, according to the frame workload. Uh, to get a workable solution, you need to use a prediction model to switch the resolution and time. To do this, first set the FPS goal target. After, you need to measure your frame statistics, the CPU and GPU timings. Uh, there are several ways to proceed with it, uh, but we prefer to use uh, an exponential smoothing average because it has a really fast response to the frame workload changes. Uh, to slightly smooth the results with two frames history. Well, and here is the heuristic to choose the, uh, the, the render target. Uh, so first, uh, every frame the engine tried to determine, is it GPU bound or not? Uh, yeah. And then uh, it first check if the average FPS is being lower than the target FPS, and uh, if if it if it does, uh, we drop the resolution by one step. Also, if the even more if the GPU continues to be fully utilized, uh, we drop another five percent. Otherwise, if the GPU starts being starving, we try to increase the frame resolution a bit. <clears throat> Our dynamic resolution system has been designed to keep in mind two points. Dropping resolution <clears throat> should work relatively fast, trying to fit the GPU to time targets as close as possible. Upscaling um, the resolution should be applied with a certain pause. Uh, um, only, for example, the last 20 frames, we had a stable GPU underutilization case. It helps to switch the resolution not so often and preserving the image details quality. Uh, well, here is uh, some kind of a results of our dynamic resolution system. So first, for a certain amount of frames, we keep our system disabled. The engine uses the 100% of our GPU frame time and uh, oh, of the render target, and the GPU frame time is about uh, 36 milliseconds, so it's completely unacceptable. But then we just switch on the system and the situation dramatically changed. The resolution percentage is now about 50%, but the GPU time mm, is much lower, only about uh, 
16 milliseconds, which is enough to draw 60 frames per, per second. Okay, and, while, and at the end, <laughs> I would like to mention the PCO management topic. Uh, we have a real problem with the Vulkan that the VK create graphics pipeline functions works uh, really slow and compare with analogous functionality in D3D backend. The cold boot of our game uh, has taken up a very long time, up to 10 minutes. Spikes in creating shaders during game sessions was extremely large too. So to do something with this, we first of all split our shaders in a scene only and a full cache shaders. Scene only is the shaders which are used only by scene objects materials uh, and another full cache. Uh, so mm, they have a, uh, we prepare their desks uh, completely dynamically. So for scene shaders, we can compile only combinations which are really being used for the specific level. And for the full cache, we need to prepare all existing variants. Uh, the benefit of the scene shaders, uh, we, can, with, we have an a priori knowledge about all of the settings, uh, the render states, the render target formats, and so on. So we can easily gather and serialize this information for each scene and use it accordingly to create the PSLs during the level startup. One question remained what to do with the full cache shaders. We can't recreate all of them because it's too long and memory space ineffective. So with Cyber, we use just a simple solution. <laughs> we ask our QA team to play each level a few times and get a enabled in game piece of statistics uh, about the full cache shaders which is being used. Now we can reuse this information during the expert stage and pre-create the full cache dynamic PSOs, which is necessary. It just works in our case. So the number of PSO creations during game sessions are negligibly small. Uh, all of the steps helps us to reduce the number of the, to reduce the cold level load in time dramatically from the 10 minutes up to one and a half. Um, of course, we need to use the <coughs> internal Vulkan pipeline PSO cache because uh, you can store the internal ESA code and use, and use it uh, for the next time runs to create the shaders, uh, to create the PSOs instantly. Uh, one important thing is to delete unused PSOs between, between the levels because uh, the driver has the limit for its own storage and PSOs sometimes can migrate to the system RAM, which leads to the performance degradation. So that's it. Now it's time to, <laughs> to listen to Jordan about some optimizations. Hello, I'm Jordan Logan. I'm the AMD dev tech that worked on with Sabre <coughs> on World War Z. Now, if you don't know about uh, what dev tech is, uh, we are, provide direct support for the developers. Uh, we also help with them find optimizations and profiling, and if there's any driver issues, we'll work directly with the driver team to make sure that the game has the best uh, experience. We'll also deal with any of those uh, GPU-specific issues that are very hard to find and fix. So I'll talk about a few of the optimizations that I helped Sabre with uh, using Vulkan. Uh, the first thing is that the transfer queue. So Vulkan exposes uh, the hardware DMA engines that are in most uh, GPUs and lets you explicitly use them. In the older APIs, they, the driver would have to do some heroics to pull uploads and downloads out of the graphics queue into a transfer queue. So this helps on all platforms except APUs, and it's a completely asynchronous to the graphics compute resources on AMD hardware, and it is the fastest way to actually get data across the PCI Express bus. bus. Uh, caveats is that it has to be explicitly used and you have to do all the synchronization yourself. Uh, because of this, we uh, recommend that you do not uh, use the transfer queue for anything that would require the graphics queue to wait on it because it takes quite a while to do that uh, synchronization point. Uh, because of this, uh, the transfer queue is actually amazing at doing uh, texture streaming, uh, which we implemented it in with, into uh, World War Z. And so in this case, we, while we're streaming on new textures, we can continue using the old texture. And once we, uh, that texture is uploaded, we can just swap it out, 
seamlessly because uh, Saber used pre-baked uh, descriptors. And so uh, with this method, though, we did have to double the amount of descriptors since you cannot write to a descriptor that you are currently using. So there's two copies of every descriptor, and we just update the next frame's descriptor and then swap them out. Doing this, we are able to keep the texture stream completely asynchronous to the rest of the graphics, and so that we, um, this causes a much better experience to the players. There's no hitches from new textures coming in. Uh, so kind of a diagram of how this worked in Saber. A new texture request will come in, either a requesting a higher MIP or a brand new texture. There's a dedicated thread that is just constantly spinning, uh, waiting for work to come in. It'll read any the texture and generate a transfer queue command list. Uh, it'll then submit this to a transfer queue, and then it'll wait for that to finish. Uh, sometimes there, there can be also be bashing if there's a lot coming in at the same time. Uh, the transfer queue will then move the data across the PCI Express, and then we'll flush it. We'll issue a barrier on the transfer queue to flush all the caches, and then it'll signal. After that, then the CPU frag it can update ne the next frame's descriptor. Uh, there's quite a few gotchas with transfer queue. Uh, we ran into quite a few of these with uh, World War Z. Um, so first off, the transfer queue can actually have a completely different granularity than the other queues. Uh, so by Vulkan spec, it is required that you either have to do a full sub-resource copy or have the number of pixels you're copying in your region has to be divisible by the queue granularity. So you have to query the transfer queue. And if you don't follow these rules, you can get a lot of undefined behavior. A uh, commonly seen one is that the transfer queue will hang and never finish its command list, causing a, eventually causing a TDR. Uh, you also have to be careful, make sure you issue all your, the proper barriers. If not, you could cause corruption as some of the caches might have stale data because they weren't notified that there's new data in that cache line. Uh, one of the biggest optimizations that we did for World War Z involved the stencil mask. So they have, so World War Z uses a stencil mask to dissolve LODs. It does this using four draws, each one setting a different uh, pixel inside a quad. And each of these draws has a different stencil ref and will reject a different pixel. Uh, when we, I profiled this using our, the AMD profile, our RGP, uh, short for radon GPU profile, I saw that these four draws had extremely low visibility, uh, uh, occupancy, even though the shader doesn't do much. Like, it was only using maybe four VGPRs and no LDS, so it should be running a lot faster. Uh, after digging in, I actually found out that these shader waves are so small that they'll actually finish before the GPU can watch another wave. But with Vulkan, we were able to actually optimize this quite well. Uh, there's a vent multi-vendor extension called Shader Stencil Export. This uh, extension will allow you to export the stencil ref from inside the shader instead of through the render state. So with this, we were able to take those four draws and combine them into a single one, single one. And the um, Shader Ref Export is exposed in both GLSO and HLSO. They have different names for it. GLSO calls it Frag Stencil Ref, and it requires a GLSL extension, and HLSL calls it SV stencil ref. So with that, we combined those four draw calls into a single one, and this allowed us to get a 75% savings for this pass since we were only issuing a quarter of the number of waves before. Uh, another optimization that we did using Vulkan was subgroup operations uh, that Nikolai mentioned earlier. These were introduced in Vulkan 1.1 and are supported by most desktop hardware, including AMD. This allowed us to bring over optimizations from the consoles that Sabre has already done, as well as letting us do several new optimizations ourselves. Uh, you do need to query the driver to see which operations are supported on, in what stages and on what hardware, as it may vary between uh, GPUs. So I'll go over two of the ones we did with subgroup ops. The first is that we used subgroup OR. So there is a whiting bit mask that is 32 bit wide that specifies on that pixel what whites it needs to check and possibly apply to the pixel. So before, uh, the shader will just loop through this and 
bit shifting it over again and again. Uh, so this meant that because of how uh, GPUs work, and that means there are several lanes being disabled. So we were able to take this and actually use subgroup or to scalarize the, these resources to try and reduce the VGPR pressure. So I have my imaginary GPU here that has four lanes and four bit, bit masks. And you see here that the lane one, two, and three have some bits set, that'll be the green, and the rest are red. So what subgroup OR does is it takes every single lane and ORs it with the headers and broadcasts it to all of them. So it kind of looks like this. And then the compiler is smart enough to realize that this is now uniform, and so since it can now promote this to a scaler, which moves it out of a VGPR for AMD. The other one, a little bit more complicated, is that we use subgroup broadcast first to do a similar thing with QMAP indexes. So for these are not bit masks and actual indexes, we can't use subgroup OR. We also use uh, broadcast first in a lot of different places to help give the compiler a opportunity well, it will hint that this is a uniform resource. So the way how uh, broadcast first works is it will read the first active lane. In this case, it will be lane one and moves that to a, a scaler. It then takes that. We then took that and we would compare it with the vector version of this to disable the lanes that are not active. From this, the compiler could figure out that everything in that if statement could be scalarized and was able to uh, reduce the VGPR pressure. Then in the next loop, we would disable everything that actually had uh, the value in that if statement, and then we would continue doing this to promote another scaler, and continue doing this until we're out of indexes. This, with these two optimizations, we were able to reduce the VGPR pressure in the lighting and was able to give a very large performance boost with uh, no visual difference. Uh, so that's the end of my section. Uh, I'd like to give thanks to everyone that helped make this possible from AMD and Sabre. Uh, thank you, and we can answer any questions you have.